you're like me and you like to steep your tea a really long time in the pot, uh, Orion's Rising is for you. It's got a lot of time, a lot of thought, a lot of life has really gone into this book. And um, Doug is a person I've known a long time. He's such a good guy. I always feel like teasing him about it. <laughs> you know, really, he's just got he's just one of those people. I just can't help myself. You know, and then he's come out with this like unbelievably serious, profound book, and I'm thinking like, oh. No. And, you know, at first I was like, what do I do here? You know, like, <laughs> but then I it just it, it just made me it just had so much more impact to me for like, for that reason. You know, when you know what a kind of person Doug is and you see the depth and seriousness of the book, it just to me it really resonates and I just congratulate you on this lifetime of excellent work that oh, is encapsulated in this fine volume, Orion Rising. Congratulations. For sale here at this bookstore, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is, you know, the, this beginning of a four hour reading, so get yourselves comfortable. <laughs> thirty minutes. Thirty minutes. Maybe thirty two minutes. Well let me start with a uh, um, a um, disclaimer and then a public service announcement, all right? All right, so here's the disclaimer. Mind is car. The clutch is slipping a little, definitely losing reverse. The rear view mirror is cracked and I can't remember the last time I changed the oil. Language creates a metaphysical conundrum. Is my mind pre-owned or is it used? If pre-owned, then what ancient soul was predestined to stumble into mine? Better to consider it used. Radio buttons stuck on the same stations. Backseat jammed with kids laughing. The tires going bald. <laughs> so this is an emergency exit, OK? In case of an emergency, that is war. That is preparation for war. That is life in 21st century North America. Do not use the legislative process. Take the streets. So anyways, it's, it's divided into three parts. Um, and uh, the first section deals with kind of my experiences as a Vietnam War veteran. Um, and you know, I've been working, we've been working a little bit now with Vietnamese people, and they refer to it as the American War in Vietnam, um, for obvious reasons, I guess. So the first section deals with that. Second section deals with my sort of reflections on what life was like for me in Maine and raising a family. And the third section is a collection of children's poems that I wrote for my kids when they're little ones. So that's the, it's a weird compilation, but Rob Shutterly said a really neat thing. He said, you know, Doug, he said, this is a weird collection. It, it almost works. Come on in. Come on in. And he said, you know what makes it work? He said, you've written the poems, these kids' poems and these family poems, that guys in, who were killed in Vietnam or for whatever reason could not write themselves. So he said, you know, you sort of carried that through for them. And I thought, I like that. I like that. It works. Let me read a few from each one of these sections, and, I, and I'll see if I can pull this thing off. So sometime about in the early 80s, um, I got heard, I don't know how, because we didn't have internet or anything like that, uh, that they were building this um, memorial to the Vietnam War in Washington. And it really, really pissed me off. Uh, so I wrote this on war memorials. The we in this poem are the um, are Vietnam veterans who came to the realization that the war was uh, an immoral, unjust, stupid venture, okay? So this is on war memorials. Corporate America, be forewarned. We are your karma. We are your Orion rising in the night sky. We are the scorpion in your jackboot. Corporate America, be forewarned. We will not buy your bloody parades anymore. We refuse your worthless praise. We spit on your war memorials. Corporate America, be forewarned. We will not feed you our bodies, our minds, our children anymore. Corporate America, be forewarned. If we have our way, and we will, the real war memorials will rise from your ashes. So that's early 80s, right? 85, I've been working with a couple of other people, four of us, five of us actually, and we formed a group called Veterans for Peace in Auburn, Maine, 1985. Five of us, we now have about 4,000 members. Uh, we have chapters in every state in the nation. We have a chapter in London, uh, England. We have a chapter in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. We have NGO status at the United Nations. We're all over the place. Our convention this year is going to be in Asheville, North Carolina, end of July. Last year it was in Madison. Uh, next year, the following year, it's going to be in San Diego. We're all over the place. All right, but it started with five of us. Um, so our first road trip, if you will, we chartered a bus, and we went down to Washington, D.C. to protest our government's policies in Central America in the, in the, in the mid mid-1980s, and to support 
four of our, our members who were uh, going through a 40-day water-only fast on the steps of the, of the Capitol. Uh, and uh, one of them is this guy, Charlie Litke, who uh, the government recognized as a hero because they gave him the Congressional Medal of Honor for uh, saving about 20 guys' lives in Vietnam. He was a chaplain in Vietnam. But for me, he's a hero because he's the only person in the history of the United States to turn back his Congressional Medal of Honor. And he did it in protest of our foreign policies in Central America. So a great heroic guy. So we go down and we do our thing. And as a side trip, um, if you will, we go over to the wall, which I had never seen before. And I went with Jerry Genacio, fellow founder of, the, of VFP, whose brother's name is on that wall. Uh, so it was a profound moment. And I have to say, yet another hero, I don't use too many heroes, uh, is Maya Lin for building that monument, which I think is the best monument in Washington, D.C. Okay, so I wrote this poem uh, on the bus on the way back. The Wall. Descending into this declivity, dug into our nation's capital by the cloven hoof of yet another one of our country's tropical wars. Slipping past the names of those whose wounds refused to, refused to heal, slipping past the panel where my name would have been could have been, perhaps should have been, down to the wall's greatest depth where the beginning meets the end, I kneel. Staring through my own reflection beyond the names of those who died so young, knowing now that the wall has finally found me. 58,000 thousand yard stairs have fixed on me as if I were their pole star, as if I could guide their mute testimony back into the world, as if I could connect all those dots in the nighttime sky, as if I could tell them the reason why. You should write about it. You should write a book about it. Like the time you held that hand or when the stars burst into flares, or how about when the earth flew away, flew away before your eyes? And how about that smell? Maybe you should write a manual detailing how to burn your shit in diesel fuel before breakfast. Or maybe you could write a song about the 175s and the eight inches blowing away your eardrums. Or perhaps a poem to the girls and their wooden faces making love to the moon bouncing behind your shoulder. Well, how about it? It's been a while. I know you still got it in you. Write something, anything, God damn you. It won't kill you, you know, at least not any more than it already has. Survivor's Manual. Of course, now my, in my dedication and my acknowledgments at the beginning of this thing, I did purposely did not mention Judy, who uh, met me when I uh, 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 got out of Vietnam, uh, and we've been together ever since. Right. So this is Survivor's Manual to Judy. If your arms and legs are still intact, you are a survivor. If tall meadow grasses still delight you with their sudden pheasants, you are a survivor. If the faces of passing children remain the faces of passing children, you are a survivor. If your nightmares will wait for the night, you are a survivor. If you can find your way back into someone's love, you, my friend, are a survivor. So I'm a survivor. <laughs> um, according to the VA, uh, there were over 100,000 uh, Vietnam veterans who killed themselves after the war, probably even more. Um, right now, right now, this day, 22 veterans killed themselves. On average, for this past year, 22 veterans a day are killing themselves uh, because of the wars that they've been involved in. Um, and I say these are conservative numbers because they didn't take into account what we referred to during the Vietnam War as single car suicide. So here's a formula for a single car suicide. Take a lonely country road. Choose a tree. Most anyone will do. Go for it like a bat out of the hell they put together just for you. Take that iron body bag and wrap it around you good and tight. Go ahead and break the sound barrier with your skull. You don't have to take any of their shit anymore now that you finally come home from the war. We in VFP, we broke the tradition, I think, of veterans, the World War II veterans and Korean War veterans who said, look, it, we're, not, we're not talking about it. We're not talking about it. Well, we took a pledge uh, in Veterans for Peace. Our pledge is, by the way, very simple. We want to abolish war and we're going to do it nonviolently. If you want to do that, you can join Veterans for Peace. But we wanted to go out and talk to younger generations uh, about what war is all about. So this is to the graduating class of 1993. 
If they got you thinking about signing up just to kill you some time, since nothing else is going down, you better be getting ready to kill you some women and some children too. And you better be getting ready to kill you some time, doing time, doing some long time, locked up in their screams. They don't consider that. I also discovered the term GI, which you know, people lovingly call you a GI, comes from the fact that you're a government issue, right? And everything you got is government issue. Hey, John, fellow non vet here in the audience. So here's a couple of government issue poems. The young man flashes by, wheel on wheel, sparkling in the sun. Two dead fish lie before him, neatly pressed in denim. Government issue at the VA hospital. I actually wrote this in the parking lot of Togas. The pale green doors remained mute before him. He read freight elevator, thought he was in the wrong place, thought again, and knew he got it right. What was left of his family waited downstairs in the lobby for what was left of him. See too much of that. This is giving silence for, for my son Josh and his buddy David when they turned 13. One of the things in this culture, of course, is that unlike many other cultures, boys know when they become men. They celebrate it in some way, right? They note, they note it. In our culture, unfortunately, usually it was you became a man when you joined the military and stuff like that. So at the age of 13, I thought I'd write this for my, my son Josh and his buddy. I make the joke, by the way, I said, I gave him a choice between a dirt bike and this poem. And he said, well, the poem, Dad, the poem. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> he did accept the poem eventually, though. So, so giving silence. If Nam vets were ancient shamans, now would be the moment we choose to give you shelter from the coming storm. But we are merely survivors of suburbs and cities, not forest nor mountain. Modern men offering you our silences, our words to guide you going out on your own. Yet we have known for years now that the silences of our fathers will not do, and we have found that words alone cannot be the sacred knives you need to bleed you free of your raging doubts. So listen up to what we have found between our own silences. Open up your fists, watch women move, scorn uniforms, don't march, dance. He's taking that to heart. I also was, uh, I've been impressed by over the years, how the Greeks can punish people, how they did wonderfully punishing people. So I wrote a couple of, of Greek-inspired uh, poems. First one's entitled Prometheus Again, and I write it for my fellow uh, in, uh, artillery man. I served with the 715th Artillery in Bong San, Vietnam. We supported the 173rd Airborne uh, guys, and when they went out and they ran into any kind of shit, they call for fire down. Bring some fire down and coordinate such and such, such and such. So Prometheus again. We once brought fire down on some village children in that latest crazy forgotten war of ours. Now we've come home to spend our days asleep on park benches beneath corporate newspapers of indifference and our nights chained to their trash cans, drunk on their ripple, muscatel, thunderbird, retching our guts up into their blind and relentless dawn. Here's a special punishment for William Westmoreland, who was the general in charge of the military at MACD, Vietnam, called Narcissus again. Picture William Westmoreland kneeling in a meadow, filling fast, oh fast, with flakes of white phosphorus. And he, gazing at his own face, reflected in pools of jellied flesh, he tries to rise. But his arms can only flail at the orange sky, and his fingers ripple off into spidery filaments of yellow smoke. And it is now, and it will be now forever, that William Westmoreland feels the faces of Vietnamese peasants melting into anguished oblivion. I hope for his part. Um, another member, the beauty of being in a group called Veterans for Peace is that I rub shoulders with some pretty amazing people. Daniel Ellsberg was Veterans for Peace. Pete Seeger joined Veterans for Peace. Charlie Clemens joined Veterans for Peace. Charlie Clemens was graduated second in the Air Force Academy. Long military family tradition. Was a combat pilot in Vietnam until they told him that he should fly combat missions over Cambodia, and he refused to do it. 
Uh, and so they gave him the catch-22 treatment, right? They put him in a psych ward. Uh, eventually he got out. Then he became a medical doctor. He studied to become a medical doctor. And he was working with impoverished people in Southern California when he noticed these Salvadoran people coming through who were horribly uh, tortured and injured and whatnot. Uh, and so, and this is amazing. You have to look, you have to read his story, his book, which was called, anybody? Say it again. It's war, yeah, yeah, memories of war, something. I'll think of it in a minute. I'll try to think of it. But anyways, uh, he had to figure out a way to join the FMLN, which are the rebels fighting against the Salvadoran government, right? So it took him like six months of hard work going to Mexico and all that stuff to find, finally get there. And he became their medical doctor for a year. Uh, and it just so happened that a French uh, film crew was there, and they picked him up, and they put together a documentary, Witness to War, Witness to War. That man has mined his car. Ha! Ah, got it. <laughs> My rearview mirror is not that correct. Okay. So, so he, yeah, they did this thing, Witness, Witness to War, which won the Academy Award, by the way, for documentary films. All right? And I had Charlie come twice to UMF uh, uh, and, and spoke of, about that film. So this is um, for Charlie Clemens. In the American vein, El Salvador is not Vietnam. San Salvador is not Saigon. Yet something seems to have slid away into the South China Sea to be born again in El Salvador. Seems something's down there dancing once again to the staccato rhythm of the M16 on rock and roll, to the shimmering wine of the 175s coming in low. Seems something's down there hungering for the American vein once again. Seems something's fixing to shoot up whatever youth it can find to do up major death. Not in Vietnam, not in Saigon, but in El Salvador, in San Salvador. This trip around the melting clock of America killing time. Counter recruitment work, Mount Blue High School, 2003. Tough day, this was a tough day. We face off, the recruiter, some Hispanic kid in camis from the Bronx, stuck up here in this very white farming town. Me, paunchy, balding, weary-eyed, three decades removed from my own war, both of us homing in on these high school kids, not slick enough to get out of town on their own. He needs them to make his rank. I need them to help me stay sane. God, if you're still around, damn this fucking war. Again and again. Guantanamo poem, January 2014. There's a group of, of uh, people in Veterans for Peace who call themselves the Veterans Peace Teams. And they're willing to, uh, co they commit uh, civil disobedience. They're willing to be arrested. They go to jail. Um, they're the, we call them the action faction. They're all, some, most of them are our age or even older. You know, it's, they're amazing, men and women, amazing. They do all kinds of stuff. So I wrote this poem for them. Egypt Pond, Maine, second poem for the veterans peace teams, wherever they are. It is legal, you know. The state even grants permits. Of course, there are limits and you do need the landowner's permission. Here's how he does it up in Maine. He cuts a good-sized sapling, then he augers a hole through the ice, sticks the steel trap onto one end, and lowers it into the pond floor. The beaver swims over out of curiosity, I suppose, and ends up with a leg open to the bone. Her efforts to break free are futile. She's pinned down, drowns. They have lungs, you know. Same, same in Guantanamo. Tie the poor bastards down. Let them feel what it's like to drown. Do it again and again. What to do? Up here, I strap on skates, take to the pond under cover of the stars, find the saplings and shake them up and down, maybe spring the traps. I don't know. You guys, our brave brothers and sisters, wrap yourselves in prison orange, fast for days on end, gather at the White House fence, maybe change some minds, we just don't know. But I won't quit, and neither will you. After all, all of us, no matter who we are, we all need each other to be free, for all of us, all of us to breathe. How are we doing? <laughs> breathing. breathing. We're breathing.
sweet dance. You spinning out the gossamer threads of a woman becoming the light in another man's eyes. Hard. <laughs> Here's a companion poem to that one, titled The Exchange is for Sandy Farmer. You carried your death closer to the heart than most of us do, I've been told. So I guess it wasn't much of a surprise to some when they finally collided. But it was to me. And then a card from your wife, she wrote how the poem to my daughter made you cry and how you sent it off to your own Elizabeth. And I thought, I gotta meet this guy. And then you died. So now I'm left with this. I imagine your daughter reading my poem aloud, the moment of your last breath, knowing through my words what one father's love can mean. And you, in exchange, sent forth filaments of your own exploding heart, deep into my daughter's dreams, fashioning them into a vision of my death so intense that she came downstairs the next morning to offer me a smile, the first we've shared in days. It's a poem from my father. Um, I begin it with a line from James Wright poem. Suddenly I realized that if I stepped out of my body, I would break into blossom. You know the James Wright poem, standing on the edge of a meadow watching these horses. A poem from my father. My father stretches out before me, his lounge chair coffin off-white polyester, his ersatz death mask snoring softly, his fingers stumbling across his stomach through the memory of some Chopin etude. It is a mid-afternoon in early July. A thunderstorm is blowing in from off West Palm Beach, raking the lagoon, sending the morning doves back into the trees. I love you, I whisper, loud enough to pull him to the surface. He eyes me, startled and scared, his breath catching on something he heard, something that may have been important. We exchange shy smiles, do not speak. I turn back to my reading. He to some meadow of the soul, where old men practice the silent art of breaking into blossom. Which I hope you did. This is to Carol, my children's teacher. And, all to, and to all good teachers, but it's particularly for you. Uh, my kids went to her wonderful school for five years, all right? And they're, they're both amazing adults, and it's, she has a lot to do with it. To Carol. And the moon could be a wise fisherwoman hauling her jeweled net through our seas. And you too could be of the moon, having pulled your tender web through my son and daughter these past five years. And as the sea following the moon forms the shore, so have you come through them to shape me. As all good teachers do, we think. We hope. We know. Here's a prayer to the road kills, right? I live in Chesterville. Right? <laughs> I've seen it over the last 40 years. I've seen a few road kills. Prayer to the road kills. To those who freeze before our tons of rolled steel and prehensile thumbs, to those instinctual followers of ill-fated paths to home, to those who leave their intestines to glisten in our taillight glow, we ask forgiveness. Forgive us these past 2,000 years of grafting mind to wheel, of thinking time was ours to steal. Three men on Bemis Mountain. A spruce root bulges out of thin soil, crosses the trail, then plunges back into the earth. Embracing, I imagine, some subterranean ledge. No superfluous leafing or flowering going on down there. And yet, surely this is some form of intelligence, says Al. I smile and bob up ahead, grunts agreement. We fall back into silent climbing, <laughs> as men often do. Mirrors, it's another one of these. I call these things, a collection of these things, the dementia poems, but I've since stopped at me. <laughs> <laughs> For obvious reasons, right? <laughs> Duh, it's self-evident. Here's a poem titled Mirrors. I have decided, I think, that my mind has become a series of walk-in closets. You know, the kind with a full-length mirror on the inside of each door. The door I just opened shuts and locks behind me. Looks like I'm not going back into that room again. But that's okay. I look into the mirror and see back over my shoulder, the future swarming into now, my grandchildren approaching, leading my children, my wife, my good friends, the dog, the cat. No, not the cat. <laughs> she moves out of sight to lick her paws and wash her face. She joins the rest of those sentient beings justifiably uninterested in my eclipsing self-reflections. <laughs> Cats often do that. Okay, and finally we'll 
jump real quickly into the children's poems. Imagine uh, Martha Lively's illustrations for these poems. Right? This is, I wrote these for the kids. Uh, we were reading a lot of A.A. A. Milne. And if you read Milne, you know, just the, length, the musicality of language. Rainbow girl. What a strange little girl, said all the doctors and her nurses, too. Her throat's yellow and her belly button's blue. And look, her knees are a bright summer green. What could it be? Is she sick or possibly in pain? Oh, no, not all or any of that. She just drank up a half full of rain and gobbled down a most enormous chunk of sunbeam, which I suppose made her mouth feel sunny. So, of course, she's all those colors. Wouldn't you be with a rainbow in your tummy? <laughs> Vegetarian doubts. Since animals are my pals, I don't eat meat. Day and night, I pack those veggies in good and tight. But suppose I end up with a zucchini for a nose, or carrots for ears, or maybe onions would roll down my cheeks instead of tears, and parsley would grow where my fingers should be. And what if every time I tried to talk, out would come a celery stalk? Oh, I know vegetables will sharpen my eyes and improve my hearing, but sometimes I really do doubt if I like being a vegetarian, <laughs> which my daughter became at the tender age of four. Yeah, five, four, five, four. Manifesto for Josh. Grab a flake of now swirling all about you. Lay down and let it melt into your child heart. Reach out and let it wash over you. Stand still and let it cover your tracks. Move on and feel no regrets at the closing of the day. Jen, the birch splits its bark, the snake its skin. The child leaps into the woman she always has been. Nothing is new, nothing is changing. The birch is the bark, the snake the skin, the child the woman. The seed flowering dies back into the earth as the child growing turns forward toward her new birth. And finally, my dad's song. Sit beside me and we'll sing along with the meadows, the swallows, and the stone wall. You and me under the tree, backs to the wall, watching the swallows be. And as far as I'm concerned, it's an, an identity crisis. I mean, you come out of a war zone and you ask yourself, who the hell am I, right? Am I this guy or am I this guy or what's going on? You know, and I, so I tossed it out to the audience, and this woman said, you know, that person also out should ask uh, her, his or her lover, who are you? I said, wow, that's profound. And then I went home, and I shared that with Judy, and Judy said, yeah, they should have said, who are we? Mm -hmm. All right? This is percolating in my head. I go back up the, into this hotel room. PTSD remedies. First off, drop the P. There's nothing post about a mirror that threatens to slit your wrist. But keep the D. I'll take disorder, sweet chaos, any time over this close order drill that haunts my early morning hours. Then let the healing begin. One, ask yourself, who am I? Two, ask your lover, who are you? Three, remain still. Wait for he or she to whisper, who are we? Now the ache has permission to leave, and the sunrise can ease you into another day. Mm-hmm.